Welcome to this video on the male reproductive system. The purpose of this video is to briefly go over the structures and functions of the male reproductive system. We will start by taking a look at the testes. So the testes are located in the scrotum. Each one is called a testicle and then plural, or you could sometimes singular, they'll say testis. And then the scrotum is the skin that protects the testes and it's held slightly away from the body. Because it needs to be about three degrees cooler than the rest of the body. And that's for um, proper sperm development. If the sperm are uh, too hot while they're developing, then not as many of them develop and they're not as um, healthy. There are muscles that um, connect the scrotum to the rest of the body and then they can tighten up to pull the scrotum in closer to keep the testes closer to the body when it's cold and then they relax when they're warm so that they can regulate that temperature perfectly. It's pretty impressive actually. Okay, so the testes are where the sperm are formed and let's go ahead and just outline the scrotum in yellow and then this word scrotum and then let's use orange for the testes right here so here's one and here's one so this is a front facing view two paired testicles and the purpose here this is where the sperm are actually formed and uh, a male will make about uh, several million a day. And this is under the influence of the hormones testosterone. And that is stimulated by... Um, the hormones from the pituitary gland. So, but the testosterone is released here and the testes function is regulated by the pituitary gland, which is way up in the brain. And it releases two hormones FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone, LH, and under and these two hormones then regulate the release and the activity of testosterone in the testes. The same pattern is seen with females, FSH and LH regulate the ovaries, then the ovaries produce est estrogen, and then eggs are maturing in the ovaries from that. So these are important reproductive hormones that regulate male and female reproductive cycles. Okay, so um, the next thing is that where they are produced, I'll um, switch over to this one right here. There are these uh, long, long tubules inside of each testicle, and they're called the seminiferous tubules. And that's where the sperm develops. And then once they are formed, and let's see, let's go red, orange, uh, oh, I didn't do red, so let's do red right here. So the seminiferous tubules in red, and then highlight that like so. And then why don't you get a green, and this is the epididymis, and it sits on top of each testicle, and it is where the sperm actually mature, so then they're ready for when sexual arousal and ejaculation occurs. So this 
in green is the epididymis. Oops, let me get that. This is where the sperm mature. They kind of uh, get their tail and they learn um, learn how to swim. So when the time comes, they're able to sp swim. Okay, so then during sexual arousal, um, the first part is that this, the ready and mature sperm will be pushed up through the vas deferens and then see how the vas deferens curls around. The whole thing is like a foot long. And then they kind of wait in this area for that final ejaculation. So when ejaculation and orgasm actually occurs, so when orgasm occurs, the, the ejaculate goes out like this. And this is the penis right here. So this whole thing is a foot long. Crazy, huh? Okay, so take a blue pen and you can color the vas deferens. Sometimes this is called the ductus deferens. And see how it, it wraps around the ureters. It's very interesting how it develops embryonically like that. And oops. Sorry, so I think I'll stop there and then that will, the rest of it's the urethra. So vas deferens up and over. Like I said, it's about a foot long. And before sexual arousal, the mature sperm are still waiting in the epididymis. And then during arousal, the sperm are gonna move up. Then we're gonna have some fluids that are added and then the ejaculate will come out during orgasm. Okay, so this is where the vas deferens ends, is where it joins up with the urethra. Let's go ahead and put the urethra in purple. And, oh, actually, so this is the urinary bladder right here. And then these are the ureters. There's two of them, and they go up to the kidneys, or I should say they're coming down, so the kidneys would be up higher and then the urine that's forming is coming down the ureters. It's stored in the bladder, and then it can leave the body through this whole thing right here, which is the urethra. But you can see we now have the same opening for urine and for semen. So during um, or before orgasm, the prostate, which is right here, we'll talk about in a second, it squeezes off this opening from the bladder so that only semen will go out and not urine. Okay, so I got a little sidetrack there. So here, this is the urethra, starting up here and then going out of the body through the penis like this. Oops, okay. Sorry, that was a crash. Okay, urethra. Then the next thing we'll do is we'll put on here the different, um, glands that are going to be adding secretions to the sperm to make sure that they can work. And I've gone through all my colors once, so I guess we're back at pink. So this first structure here, these are paired glands called the seminal vesicles, and they make most of the fluid that's going to be found in sperm or in semen. So we'll do these here. These are the seminal vesicles. They're little glands, but fairly mighty. And what you'll find in their fluids is that it's alkaline, and this is awesome and important because the female reproductive tract, the vagina, is very acidic, so that's a good thing. It's supposed to keep infections away, right? But if we're going to eventually continue the species, then that needs to be neutralized so that the sperm can survive in the reproductive tract. So the pH of semen is actually a little bit alkaline so that the sperm can survive in the reproductive tract until they get up into the uterus. There's also um, sticky proteins here. Now, they're not sticky at first. It's kind of like a jello, I guess, because you have this protein that is a fluid at this warm body temperature. And then once it after ejaculation, it kind of gels up on the cervix. And that will help it stick to the cervix, which is the opening of the uterus. 
so it doesn't fall out. So the sperm get to stay in the body of the female. Helps it to stick to the cervix. Oops, cervix of uh, the female. So that's an important thing. And then there is a fructose also in these fluids, and that helps the sperm survive. They use that to make ATP. They can survive for up to five days in the female reproductive tract thanks to a variety of nutrients in the semen, but especially this fructose here. Okay, so then um, you've got, so the sperm, you know, they come up here and they go around the ureter and then they get all this fluid from the seminal vesicles and then they go through the prostate gland. So we'll use orange for that. And be careful here because my picture, I think the one you're using, I made a better picture, but this is meant to represent the prostate here. And why don't we do this one on the other side? So the prostate gland it has um, some a, a little bit of fluid that it adds. But what I think is an interesting function it has is it has smooth muscle that contracts to close off the urethra. during ejaculation. So even though semen and urine have to share the same exit point, um, they are not mixing. So that's the prostate gland. Now this, um, with age, it's pretty well known that this um, enlarges. And as it enlarges, we um, will usually call that benign hyperplasia, benign meaning that it's not um, going to travel, these like cancer cells aren't going to travel anywhere. And hyper means too much and plasia means growth. So it becomes too large and sometimes um, prostate cancer can actually be diagnosed. The good thing is about prostate cancer is that it's typically not metastatic. So it might get larger and larger, but the cells don't travel to the lungs or to the bone or something like that. And this causes a problem, though, in men as they get older because the enlarging prostate squeezes on the urethra and it starts to close it even when they're not having an ejaculation. And then they're not able to urinate when they need to, and it can cause them a lot of discomfort. Okay, so then the last gland, so red, orange, yellow... This one right here, this is called the bulbourethral gland, otherwise known as Cowper's gland. We'll have to put this one way up here. Bulbourethral. You can see that it because it's joining right up with the urethra there. Also known as Cowper's gland. And the bulbourethral gland, I think, has a very interesting role. The fluids that it releases are often pre-ejaculatory. So let's say the man is aroused and the sperm are like right here, but ejaculation hasn't occurred yet. Before ejaculation occurs, sorry, I missed, um, these bulbourethral glands will release, release a little bit of alkaline fluid to clear out the urethra of any acidity, once again, so that the sperm are more likely to survive the journey out the urethra and up the vagina and hopefully into the uterus and fallopian tubes for fertilization. So it's also known as that, and so it has releases what's known as an alkaline. So again, that's a, a pH, a basic pH, pre-ejaculate that neutralizes acidity in the urethra. All right, so we'll go through that again real quickly. The testes make the sperm 
They're formed in the seminiferous tubules. They mature in the epididymis. Then, during the earlier stages of arousal, the sperm will move up and over, up the vas deferens, over the top of the ureter. They will collect, and then when ejaculation occurs, they're going to collect fluid from the seminal vesicles and the prostate gland, and a little bit from the bulbal urethral gland. And then the ejaculate itself will be about two to five mils. Why don't we put this here? So the ejaculate will be two to five milliliters of semen. A healthy amount should be, I mean, there's a big range, honestly, somewhere between like 40 million and, but uh, 200 million sperm in a, in a healthy ejaculate. And um, I guess that was all I was going to say about that. Oh, I wanted to talk about, um, let's see, sorry, so red, orange, yellow, green. Let's just put that. So the ejaculate. And then what is important for delivery of the sperm into the vagina is an erection. And the erection, uh, I think I'll just use orange again right here. This tissue right here is really special tissue. Females have erectile tissue too. And that's in the form of the clitoris usually, but also in the labia and in the vagina itself. So let's go over here. This is messy, isn't it? Sorry. Okay, so this erectile tissue, it's called the corpus, which means body, cavernosum, because it's cavernous and can fill with blood. So it becomes engorged with blood. And that's what causes an erection. And like I said, this happens in the female clitoris too during sexual arousal. Okay, and then the last thing I wanted to say about the act, the sexual arousal and ejaculation or orgasm. This is something that we talk about in when we do the nervous system a little bit. Uh, so let's use a pink right here, or actually green first. So in order to have a healthy sexual response for men and for women, a, I like to say it takes two to tango, or you need both arms of the autonomic nervous system. So the first part is you need parasympathetic stimulation for arousal. So this is actually, it's parasympathetic nerves that cause the erection. And they do this by causing the blood vessels, uh, uh, dilation of the blood vessels, in the penis, which then cause the erectile tissue to engorge. So you've got to have this going on. For females, the importance here, you can see this parasympathetic would cause um, sexual arousal for her too with the um, clitoris uh, swelling with blood. And then in order to have an, a successful ejaculation, wait, what am I doing? Sympathetic, I was trying to put systemic. Sympathetic is going to cause um, orgasm and ejaculation. So sympathetic nerves, sorry, that's a sympa, sympathetic, and parasympathetic nerves are both required for a healthy um, sexual response. Let's put that here. And when I say successful, I mean arousal and ejaculation. Um, I also wanted to point out, so with erectile dysfunction, um, the medications are directed at this part of the um, equation. So we could even put that on here. So ED or erectile dysfunction drugs usually target this. 
So what they're trying to do is get the blood vessels to dilate and the corpus cavernosum to successfully become engorged. Okay, in the next couple of videos, I'll talk about the female reproductive system and then fertilization, and we may get to pregnancy too.